so it talks about uh, fasting in Ramadan. It talks about uh, the people who are excused uh, from fasting, like the traveler and the sick person. Uh, it also mentions uh, uh, the Quran and uh, you know uh, the fact that the Quran was revealed uh, in the month of Ramadan uh, and uh, why it is important to recite the Quran. Uh, also, uh, the, you know, it has an, an important principle, which is, the, which is the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants ease for us, and He does not want hardship for us. And this is why uh, we have those uh, permissions: the fact that we don't have to fast while traveling or sick. Uh, so that is an important principle to keep in mind for similar cases. And then at the end, there's a hint to Eid also. So even you get Eid there because at the end He said so that you complete the month, al-idda, meaning you complete the count, because you count either 29 or 30 days. So there is a count, and I'm sure all of us become better counters in the month of Ramadan. Uh, so we start counting, you know, day one, day two, all the way to day 29, day 30. So it says that, it mentions, so that you complete uh, the count, and that you make takbir. So that is a hint about the Eid in this verse, and that is specifically verse 185. So there's a hint about Eid because what do you do in Eid? What is the most common dhikr that you make in Eid? It is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, as, as we know. And we do it out of thankfulness. So this takbir here is done out of uh, gratefulness. And then there's one verse that talks about dua because we know Ramadan is a month of dua, making a lot of prayers and, and supplications. Now, rarely we turn the page and that is if you have the common mushaf that is printed usually in, in Mecca and Medina, uh, it has usually those uh, 15 lines in each uh, page of the copy of the Quran. So each page has exactly 15 uh, lines. And if you had an old, old Quran, uh, it was never like that. So the verses never ended at the exact uh, end of the page. Now uh, they've done something magical and they have made sure that every page uh, ends with uh, at the end of a verse. So the verse doesn't have to straddle to the next page. So you see that in each and every page that at the end, there's an end of a verse as well. And it's exactly 15 lines in each page. My point is, so if you have that kind of mushaf, which is very common now, then you have to turn the page and there's one more verse left. And usually it is left out. We don't usually go to the next page because for different reasons, some of it we think is not relevant. It is also historical in a sense because uh, for that last verse, there's actually a story behind it. And we can say it's a reason of revelation. That's another way to refer to it. As you know, in the Quran, a lot of verses were revealed for a particular reason under a particular situation or circumstance. So for that reason, we call it Asbab uh, al-Nuzul, the reason of revelation. Not all the verses are like that, but some of them are related to a particular incident. So, um, <clears throat> the particular incident here was that in the beginning of Siyam, so we know fasting was not uh, mandatory in Mecca, right? There was some type of, uh, you know, voluntary fasting. There's also the fasting of the day of Ashura in Mecca, but when uh, Muslims migrated to Medina in the second year uh, after Hijrah, after migration, uh, this is when the fasting of the month of Ramadan, the entire month of Ramadan was legislated. Initially, however, there was a, a subtlety, there was a little difference in the way they fasted. So after the break of fast, they were allowed to eat and drink up till Isha time, or if you fell asleep and then you have to start your fasting from the night. So let's say you went and prayed Isha, you can no longer eat and drink after that or have a relationship with your wife uh, or your, I mean your spouse, uh, both ways, right? Uh, likewise, if you, let's say you broke fast after Maghrib and then you fell asleep, as soon as you wake up, now you have to start your fast. So it was super hard on Muslims to do that. Imagine now, it's not just, uh, you know, you think it's a long day. Now, you know, you might fast 15 hours or 17 hours. Back then it was even harder because you only got that little window between Maghrib and Isha or between Maghrib 
uh, and the time you fall asleep if you fell asleep before Isha. And it so happened that one of the companions was working in the field and he came and he was so tired. And he asked his wife for some food and she said, I don't have any food ready yet. Let me go and get something. Let me go and fetch some food for you. And by the time she came back, because he was so exhausted, he fell asleep without any food. So imagine he came to, uh, you know, break fast. Uh, he did not find anything. He fell asleep and now he cannot eat, eat anymore. So his wife came and he said, and she saw him uh, laying down, uh, you know, and, uh, and sleeping. And, uh, you know, she got worried. She said, woe to you. Now you've missed your iftar and you cannot have food until the next day. Anyway, the, the man fasted, but he couldn't handle it after, I think, uh, you know, noon or something. He fell unconscious. And this is when these verses were revealed as a concession, as a permission for them to eat and drink the entire night. So this is one reason I think we don't recite the verse because it has some historical uh, uh, you know, significance, but not necessarily something that is applicable to us today. But this is exactly the reason I'm reciting it for you today because I think that uh, this time, it is these kinds of verses that we should focus on. As we know, this Ramadan is gonna be like no other Ramadan you've ever seen in your entire life. Some of us might be young, some of us might be old, but I'm pretty sure even if you're old, you've not seen a, a Ramadan where everything was closed. Even the Masajid, Mecca and Medina, uh, and everything else almost, except maybe, uh, maybe some grocery stores and maybe hospitals and stuff like that, but the vast majority of uh, places, organizations, uh, companies, everything is closed. So this is unprecedented, and this is how we should think about this Ramadan. We're going to fail Ramadan if we go into Ramadan with the mentality, with the attitude, though, that it is like the other Ramadan. I'm going to try and make it look like the other Ramadan as much as possible. We've got to think differently this time. We have to think of outside the box, as we say. And this is one of the verses I want you to focus on. And like I said, this Ramadan is going to be different. So you're going to focus on different verses. You're going to look into different acts of worship as we're going to discuss. And this is how, inshallah, we're going to, uh, you know, get the fruits and, and get the best out of this Ramadan. But you have to start with a different mindset. And that's the first thing I want to mention here. So why is this verse interesting in this context? If you read this verse, it's Almost all of it is about what is allowed, what is permissible. Because when you say, when I tell you, and any, anyone uh, will, will uh, mention, the night of Ramadan, what do you think of? As soon as we talk about the night of Ramadan, your mind will go immediately to the prayers of Tarawih. But it is interesting in this entire verse, and it's a long verse, about half a page, uh, there's almost no mention of Tarawih. There's a mention of i'tikaf, no doubt, and that is, that is uh, you know, part of Ramadan. Usually it happens in the last 10 uh, days of Ramadan. And it's not limited to the night. In fact, uh, the i'tikaf you do uh, could be uh, around the clock. You, you know, you can, the different types of i'tikaf, obviously you can make i'tikaf uh, uh, for a short period of time. If you don't have, like you don't have any time off from work then you can do it maybe for a day or two. And some people do it for the entire 10 days. That's how the Prophet did it anyways. So he would go to the masjid and camp the entire 10, 10 days or you know, 24 hour days. But that's the only mention there of, of worship. Everything else in the verse is talking about what is allowed. So that is, that is one thing to keep in mind, inshallah. Now, obviously this ayah, as I said, came to tell the Muslims that it is okay to enjoy the night and keep this balance between worship and a pleasure and joy. So that is one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is, it says, eat and drink. I'm going to skip. I'm not going to uh, you know, focus on every uh, you know, word. But inshallah, if you go back and also read and contemplate, as we're going to say later, uh, you know, reading uh, with contemplation, like deep reading is essential th this time around. Uh, we have no excuse. In the other Ramadans, I understand you're so busy, you're jumping from one masjid to another or from one imam to another. Some people do that. Or, or you're, you're wanting to do the 20 rak'ah, however many rak'ahs. This Ramadan, the, the key in this Ramadan, the clue in this Ramadan is deep reading. 
because you have the time. There's no excuse. You, don't, you can't say, well, I need to finish eating quickly so I can catch the imam and the first rak'ah or the first, uh, you know, saf, you know, the first line because the masjid is going to be crowded. No more pressure like that. No more racing like that. So the key in this Ramadan is to slow down and think about what you're doing. Make the intention, all the intentions you can make because you have time for it. So time is one thing that you cannot use as an excuse. And inshallah, we'll talk about that a bit later. Now, also what you see in this ayah, in this verse, uh, it says, you eat and drink. Again, it's talking about what is allowed. So it says, you eat and drink until you see dawn. Again, I'm, I'm summarizing here. I'm not going to go into the technicalities and the white thread and the black thread. I'll leave that to you, inshallah. And if you have any questions, we can do that later. But essentially, it says, you eat and drink until dawn. And then you start your fast. In fact, this is the verse that tells us how fasting is done. So it says, you, you eat and drink until dawn, right? And, and this is, by the way, important because something, some people think, well, I have to stop maybe half an hour before dawn. This verse is clear that you keep eating and drinking until uh, the break of dawn. And then you start your fast all the way to the night. And the beginning of the night, the signal uh, that tells us that the night has started is sunset. And this is where we get the fact that fasting is from dawn to sunset. And then there is uh, this uh, sentence that talks about i'tikaf. We talked about it. And that's it. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the verse by saying, this is how Allah clarifies the signs for you, the rulings, the, you know, uh, the rulings of fasting in this case, uh, uh, and uh, everything else related to Ramadan. So this is like a conclusion to the entire passage, not just to this uh, verse. And this is uh, so that you accomplish taqwa. Now remember, in the very beginning of this passage, in ayah number 183, it mentions taqwa. And at the very end, it mentions taqwa, which tells us that the main theme, if, if I was to put any theme for the month of Ramadan, like one theme, like if I asked you, give me one word for the month of Ramadan, you should close your eyes and say taqwa. This is really the main goal, the main objective for Ramadan is uh, to accomplish taqwa. So you see that in the very beginning, in the first verse, 183, and you see it also at the end of 187. So you see taqwa uh, from beginning to end. Ramadan is surrounded by taqwa. You start with taqwa, you end with taqwa. Uh, and uh, again, as you know, taqwa is uh, to accomplish this uh, consciousness, this awareness of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to have you know, certain uh, uh, awe and fear uh, from him so that you don't uh, trespass his boundaries. That's really the ultimate uh, goal. Now, uh, let us uh, sit back a little bit and relax and, and think about this, because as I said, we have to start with uh, a new mindset and uh, to think outside the box, because this Ramadan is gonna be like no other Ramadan we have faced. Now, what is interesting is that I know all of us have been accustomed to certain things that we expect from the month of Ramadan. Like as soon as I say the word Ramadan, I'm sure to your mind comes certain memories and certain events. So you cannot imagine Ramadan, for example, without Taraweeh. And you cannot imagine a Ramadan without Taraweeh in the masjid, like a congregational uh, prayer with the Imam reciting the entire Quran from beginning to end, uh, preferably with a nice voice, and the, the masjid, the masjid packed full uh, of, of people from all uh, you know, walks of life, people you've never seen before, people you've not seen the entire year. You see uh, young and old, you see men and women, uh, and, and you, you know, it is no doubt a, a fond memory we all have. Another memory or event that we see a lot in the month of Ramadan is these communal iftars, right? I mean, you may not have it every day, but you know, some masajid do hold it every day. So some people are, are, are used to having iftar with people every single day. And others, if you, even if you don't do it every single day, uh, some people do it on, on weekends. So at the least, you're gonna attend few of those uh, congregational or communal iftars. And obviously this is again, something that you may not see this time around. What I want you to do now is, I want us to uh, go back and think about how Ramadan was at the time of the Prophet Because you're gonna be surprised that 
a lot of things that we think of when we think of Ramadan, we think of like those events I mentioned did not exist at the time of the Prophet. So in a way, uh, and I, I'm trying to also bring some, I hope some optimism and some a positive thinking when it comes to this Ramadan, you're going to be amazed that some of these uh, uh, things that we're going to miss did not even exist at the time of the Prophet. And maybe, maybe that this Ramadan in some ways, not in everything, in some ways might be closer to the way the Prophet ﷺ fasted and worshipped in the month of Ramadan. So let me give you maybe a bit of that, and just a taste of it. Just to think how the Prophet had Ramadan and, and how, I mean, obviously Ramadan and the uh, various acts we do in the month of Ramadan, uh, they no doubt have evolved across the ages and the centuries. So maybe, in a, and we always, we could say it's a blessing in disguise, at least in some respect, now is a chance to maybe live and experience the month of Ramadan a bit like the Prophet himself, Isa and the companions experienced the month of Ramadan. And this is one way we can make this Ramadan very, very special in a way that we've never imagined before. So, uh, if you go in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, we know uh, the book of Imam al-Bukhari is one of the most, in fact, the most authentic book of hadith uh, from the Prophet And if you were to go to, actually there is a, uh, a chapter in the book of Imam al-Bukhari uh, talking about taraweeh, the prayer of taraweeh. And what he's going to do, Imam al-Bukhari, he's going to give you different narrations of how the prayer of taraweeh evolved during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and eventually later during the time of the companions of the Prophet, like the times of uh, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum. And now we don't have time to go over all the narrations. I'm trying to summarize it, but I'll mention a few interesting uh, milestones. One of them you find in hadith uh, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, she said, uh, <clears throat> uh, and she's basically narrating that to her nephew Urwa. Because Urwa is Urwa ibn Zubair. We know as Zubair ibn al-Awwam was married to Asma. And Asma was the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, okay? So she's narrating that to Urwa ibn Zubair. And she told him that the Prophet alayhi uh, salam kharaja laylatan min jawf al-layl. So he exited his house in the middle of the night. And he prayed in the masjid. So this is in the month of Ramadan. Again, remember, Imam al-Bukhari is narrating this hadith under the book of Taraweeh. So this is in the month of Ramadan. So it seems like his habit was to pray in the house, and one day he made it an exception, and he exited his house, and he went to the masjid. Now, if, you, if you've been to the masjid of the Prophet in Medina, you probably see or know that his masjid was right next to his house. So you, he, he can open his door, and he's already in the masjid. It's right by the road, by the way. Um, so he said, or she said, So he exited, he went to the masjid, and there were a few people there, a few men, so they just lined up behind him, and they prayed. And it was kind of a coincidence. So next morning, when people woke up, they started talking about that. They heard that some, some men were lucky enough to pray behind the Prophet ﷺ. So they thought it's a thing. Now maybe we can pray behind the Prophet in the month of Ramadan. But it was totally casual the first day. So the next day, more people gathered. The next day, same thing happened. But now they know about At least some people heard about it. So they came and there were more people who prayed behind the Prophet ﷺ the second night. And in the morning, people were, were talking even more. So now the third night, there was a big crowd. So in, in the third night, there were many people now gathered uh, and uh, wanting to pray behind the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan. So and indeed, the Prophet came out and they prayed behind them. And when the fourth night came, she said, Ajaz al-Masjid wa an like the masjid could not handle its people. Like there were so many people, it could not even take that many people. So the, the masjid was not big enough to handle this size, this many people. 
But look, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, came out only uh, at the time of Fajr. So he did not come out to pray, you know, night prayer or taraweeh. And as you see, I mean, from the hadith, there's not a big distinction, by the way, from taraweeh, between taraweeh and night prayer. As long as you pray at night, you can call it taraweeh. And there are basically technical reasons why we call it taraweeh. We can mention that later. But essentially, the Prophet ﷺ, on purpose, he did not come out before Fajr. He came out on, uh, at the time of Fajr and he prayed Fajr and he led the people uh, in the prayer of Fajr. And when he finished from the prayer of Fajr, Fajr, he turned around, he said the Shahada, Fatah Shahad, like, you know, uh, in the beginning of a speech, you, usually you can make Shahada, right? And then he said, Amma ba'd, فَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَخْفَ عَلَيَّ مَكَانُكُمْ He said, I, am, I was totally aware of your positions. Like, I was aware that you guys came and waited for me and everything. However, the reason I did not come out was because I was afraid that this prayer would become mandatory upon you. Like, if, I, if, it, if it became a habit, right? If every, every night I came out and you guys prayed behind me, many Muslims will think now that this prayer is mandatory just like uh, you know, Salatul Jama'ah, like the fund, the, the five uh, daily prayers, right? So he was afraid that people at least will misunderstand and think that this prayer of Taraweeh or this prayer of uh, night, uh, night prayer has been made mandatory because we know the action of the Prophet is not like the action of me or, or you or not even like the action of a companion. Uh, the companion can make, uh, can make an action. It does not make it a sunnah. Uh, meaning that it doesn't become uh, obligatory. But if the Prophet himself uh, did it, a lot of people will think that it is uh, uh, mandatory. So he said, I was afraid that it will be made obligatory on you. There's another possible interpretation, interpretation here is that if the Prophet did it, then Allah might make it also obligatory. And then you will not be able to handle it. If it becomes mandatory, I mean, subhanAllah, we know even the five daily prayers, uh, it's not easy sometimes, or it's not easy on certain people, or it's not easy on us all the time. So what if even the uh, taraweeh was made mandatory? And by the way, some people nowadays think it is mandatory, maybe because of culture. But uh, uh, if you go back to the sources of Islam, no one says that it is mandatory. Uh, everybody agrees that it is uh, a highly recommended uh, sunnah. It is definitely voluntary. Uh, but highly recommended. Anyway, it says the Prophet ﷺ died upon that. Like nothing changed until the Prophet died. ﷺ. So this is what Aisha told Urwa. All right. Now you also notice that uh, Imam al Bukhari, in his in the same chapter, he also narrated the uh, the famous famous hadith. Uh, that if you stand up in prayer in the month of Ramadan, meaning every night of Ramadan, and you do it out of Iman and out of expectation for a reward, that then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of your previous or prior sins. And by the way, you see two similar narrations. One, one says, if you fast the month of Ramadan out of Iman and out of expectation of reward, then also your previous sins will be forgiven. In the third narration, if you, uh, if you revive or if you, uh, you know, spend the Laylatul Qadr, the night of Qadr, again, out of Iman, out of Ihtisab, your previous sins will be forgiven. And somebody might say, well, what, it, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that my sins will be forgiven three times? No. Basically, here the Prophet ﷺ is giving you three opportunities. Because none of us will be perfect in all three. So some of us might do better in fasting, some of us might do better in uh, Qiyam, and some of us might do better in Laylatul Qadr. So you have three chances. Now if you get three, uh, all three, great. Uh, you get more reward in that case. So don't try and play smart, right? Anyways, so you notice Imam Bukhari here is uh, mentioning this uh, hadith, but you notice in, th in this hadith there's no reference to congregation whatsoever. It, it just says, if you, and it, in fact, it, it addresses the singular, it's addressing one person, man qama, like whoever does it. So it, it, it didn't say, Iva qamu, like all of them. It says, man qama, whoever does it. And it's like Imam al-Bukhari is taking a hint from that. And then after that, he said, Ibn Shihab, who, who is one of the tabi'in, who is also one of the narrators, he said, the Prophet, alayhi died upon that. 
died upon this idea that everybody is praying separately uh, in a singular form. And all the people were upon that. And this was the case uh, across the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. So the time of Abu Bakr when he was a leader, it was also the same way. Like people were praying in their houses individually. And part of Khilafah at Umar, also part of the uh, leadership of Umar عنه, until something happened at the time of Umar uh, that changed everything. And this is where we got our tradition of praying in the masjid. It came from Umar عنه. So what happened at the time of Umar, some of the, you know, uh, some of the uh, companions were coming out and praying in the masjid. Some prayed at home, some prayed in the masjid. Even in the masjid, some of them were praying individually, just like we pray sunnah in the masjid, right? When, when the imam finishes the congregational prayer, we see people will go around, you know, some people pray behind a certain uh, pillar or post or, or anywhere, and they start praying individually, right? This is how it was done at the time of Umar, in the beginning of the time of Umar. So some people will pray individually, and some people will pray in smaller jama'ah. So you might find one jama'ah here, one jama'ah there, but they were not combined, they were not together. So until Umar looked at it and he said, you know, it is better since they're coming to the masjid anyways. Why not combine all of them under the leadership, under the imam, imamship, if you, if you like, of one person? And he chose one of the, uh, you know, known reciters and he was one of the preservers, in fact, who preserved and wrote the Quran. He was also a, you know, a memorizer of the Quran. Uh, and that was Ubay bin Ka'ab, right? So this is when uh, the, first, the first official taraweeh, if you will, happened. It was the time of Umar, and he gathered everybody uh, under one imam, okay? So this is a bit of history. Uh, and subhanAllah, I mean, Islam is great because it gives us all these options. Uh, so the fact that, so here's the thing. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ did not pray it in congregation shows us that this is one option we can do. Now, obviously, this Ramadan, we have no other option. But what, the reason I'm saying this is because don't think that you're doing something uh, way off. If you pray Ramadan individually this time, if you pray Taraweeh individually this time, you are doing exactly what the Prophet did. Now, I'm not going to go here into some fiqhi issues, which one is better. Uh, you know, the point is, we get a chance to do it exactly like the Prophet used to do it. We get a chance to do it exactly like the companions did it before the Prophet died. And you know, we never know, maybe this is uh, you know, a great blessing for us that at least maybe once, hopefully it does not repeat in the future, hopefully next Ramadan we will have it in the masjid, but maybe this is once in a lifetime opportunity where we pray exactly like, and we experience exactly what the Prophet experienced, السلام, praying it at home. And remember, in his, I mean, as Aisha narrated, he did it only three times in Jama'ah. All the other times, he was praying at home. Because we know from the other hadith of Aisha, she said that the Prophet ﷺ never skipped his prayer at night, whether it was Ramadan or not Ramadan. He would always pray like 13 rak'ah. In different narrations, one says 11, one says 13, but that's if you, you know, add uh, witr and all of that. But the point is, uh, this was a habit of the Prophet ﷺ, and the vast majority of the time, he did it in his house. Now, just to uh, finish this, uh, you know, this topic, this uh, opinion kind of lingered in, in, the, in the schools of law, in the schools of thought, like in the Shafi'i and the Hanafi and all of that, you still can find one of the opinions saying that it is better to pray home because of this, because of what I told you. Now you might say, well, maybe the common opinion or the, maybe the, the stronger opinion is that you pray Taraweeh in the Masjid. But again, just to give you this, uh, you know, we need to understand the diversity of the opinions in Islam. Because nowadays, unfortunately, we see some people who are like very, very strict on a particular school and they're not willing to even uh, consider or negotiate or allow for, not, uh, for another opinion. So, for example, example, it's one of the opinions in the school of Imam Malik, one, not, not all, I mean, obviously the other one says you pray in the masjid, but one of the opinions in uh, the school of Imam Malik, also Abu Yusuf, which we know he is the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, and some of the Shafi'i, they say, prayer at home is better, like even if you have the option to pray in the masjid, 
again, it's, um, you can say it's a minority of opinion, it's a minority opinion, but it is still an opinion, it's a valid opinion. And they said it is better to pray in the house, not only because the Prophet did it in his lifetime, but also because they used a general hadith uh, of the Prophet who said, أفضل صلاة المرء في بيته إلا المتوبة. He said the best uh, prayer you can make. And, and again, I want to invoke this hadith now because I want you to think about it when you pray home this time in the month of Ramadan. He said the best prayer you can do. And I don't know how many of us have heard this before, but that's really interesting. He said, and this hadith of the Prophet is sahih, it's authentic. He said the best prayer you can do is the prayer you can do in your house. Again, the best prayer you do is the prayer you do in your house except the mandatory prayer. So essentially the Prophet is telling us, no doubt when it comes to the mandatory prayer, no doubt praying in the masjid is better. There's no uh, dispute about that. There's no difference of opinion. Every scholar agree that prayer, if you want to pray the five daily prayers, the prayer in the masjid is better. And of course there is a difference of opinion whether it is mandatory to pray in the masjid or is it highly recommended uh, or, or is it even some people, but that's an extreme opinion, they say it is a pillar. Like if you don't pray in the masjid, your prayer doesn't even count. But like I said, this is a minority opinion, alhamdulillah. Uh, but the, the main dispute is whether praying in the masjid is mandatory or it is recommended. So you weigh between these two, two opinions. But every other prayer, the Prophet said, according to this hadith, every other prayer is better done in your house. So that includes also the sunnah, right? So let's say you pray to Isha, you want to pray sunnah afterwards. Of course, you can pray in the masjid, but the Prophet said, said in this hadith, he said, it is better if you go home and pray uh, the sunnah prayer. Why is that? Uh, I mean, uh, there are two reasons, basically. One is because um, it's better for sincerity, right? If you pray in the masjid, uh, there, is an, there could be an element of show off. But if you come and pray in your house, then now you're praying by yourself in seclusion, no one will see you, so it's better for your sincerity. But the other reason is because, and he mentioned that in a different narration, he said because you don't want your house to be deprived from the mention of God. That's the other reason. He said, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورة. صلوا في بيوتكم. He said, do not make your houses like graveyards because you don't pray in the graveyard. A graveyard you're not supposed to pray in the graveyard um, again for different reasons we're not going get, to get into that right now so uh, but also the graveyard implies that there is a void there is no uh, like there is uh, this um, uh, disconnect there's a lack of uh, uh, you know compassion and stuff like that I mean it, it might give you this uh, spooky feeling when you go in the uh, graveyard. So he said, do not make the house like that. Do not make it spooky like that. And the way you could, you know, enlighten your house and make it, uh, you know, a friendlier house, if you will, is to mention, uh, you know, the name of God and that you do by prayer. So, inshallah, all of that can happen this time. So think about all of these uh, ideas and think about all of these uh, meanings when you pray in your house this time. The fact that now you are making your house uh, a, a better house. The fact that you are reciting the verses of Allah in the house of, uh, in your house. Uh, and uh, you know, inshallah in, in that process, you are also uh, expelling all of the uh, shayateen, right? Uh, also in that case, what happens, uh, every member of your family will see you. Like, so for example, a lot of people may, might, might have rushed to the masjid to pray taraweeh and they leave their family behind and they don't experience any of the spirit of Ramadan because they stay home and there's no one to tell them what to do. There's no one to tell them to pray. So they end up playing games or they do something else. They might continue eating after you leave. So now you have an opportunity also to uh, participate. And instead of having a congregational pre prayer, now you're going to have a familial prayer, like a prayer with the family. Uh, inshallah, I, I, know, I think uh, I, I do want to leave time for questions, but I will leave, inshallah, I will leave the, uh, I will stop the talk uh, mentioning some ideas and some things that we can do this Ramadan that we, might have, we may not have done, uh, or we may not have had the opportunity to do uh, in the previous Ramadans. Um, 
also the fact that there are uh, certain elements uh, or certain things in this Ramadan uh, that would give us actually, uh, or you can look at them as a positive thing. Uh, so, uh, so let me mention maybe a few ideas here. First of all, uh, a lot of us are working from home, right? And this is a great blessing in the month of Ramadan. And I think uh, people who worked, especially early in the morning, know exactly what I'm talking about. It's super uh, exhausting to, for example, uh, stand up in Taraweeh or now, let's say, the last 10 nights you are praying in the masjid, maybe the majority of the night, you come home, you have no time to sleep, you, 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 ca you catch some suhoor, you might uh, even have the suhoor in the masjid and pray Fajr in the masjid, and then you rush back home, uh, you catch your two hours of sleep, and then you have to wake up and go to work. So for some people, this is really, really hard because you barely get any sleep. I used to actually joke and say, my challenge in the month of Ramadan was not eating and drinking. I don't worry about eating and drinking. I don't even worry about being hungry or thirsty. I worry about sleep because I don't get any of it. Like this schedule is so demanding and so tight. So you get your two hour here, three hour there. You're lucky if you get any REM sleep. I'm honest here. I'm very, I mean, I'm very, you know, uh, very honest here. Some people do not get the REM sleep or they get only one round of that. So basically you have to get your fragments and stitch them together. Like you're going to have two hour after Fajr. Maybe if you're lucky, you come, you come home before sunset, you might catch a, you know, a one hour or two hours. And then maybe after Taraweeh, another two hours, but it's really hard. So this time, if you're working from home, especially if your schedule is flexible, Alhamdulillah, this is a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the positive side. The fact that our schedule, although you might work the same hours, you have much more flexibility. At least you don't have to drive while drowsy. I mean, that's another challenge I used to have. And I'm sure some of you had it too. Uh, you're driving to work or coming back from work and you, can, you cannot keep your head up. You're like your, your head is falling asleep and you're worried if you're going to make it safe, uh, make it home safe, because you are uh, falling asleep as you drive. So these are good things. Alhamdulillah, this time we may not have to deal with all of that. And let's take, and again, the, the mindset this Ramadan is take advantage uh, in every situation. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything positive. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying everything will be positive, but there's certain things that will, will play in our favor this time. And let's acknowledge that. Let's say Alhamdulillah for that. I mean, every bit matters. Every small thing matters. Um, so saving on the commute is great. Also saving yourself, maybe saving your, your life if you are uh, driving while drowsy. Um, another thing is, um, I mentioned that already, breaking fast with the family. That's a great opportunity now that every day you can do that. Um, even the negative things like not having the communal of thought, not having the taraweeh, as I mentioned earlier, think of it positively in the sense that I'm doing it like the Prophet did it in his time. Because again, the people at the time were very poor. There was no, no big iftar parties uh, or these luxurious or you know, extra, extravagant uh, iftars. You see every type of food on the table and you see uh, you know, all the dignitaries, you know, sitting there and, and not able to finish, you know, half of the food or, or even, you know, less. Think of the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the vast majority of people were poor. And their food was very simple. And nowadays, also now, I mean, this time around, it could be similar to that. I mean, some of us at least may not have that much money left. Uh, they're going under some financial situation if they were let go, if they were, if they were unemployed, and they might have to uh, like conserve on food. And they have to be very frugal when it comes to what, whether buying food or you know, uh, keeping food. So that's also another element we have to think about. And even if you're, not, if you're in that situation, think of it this way. The fact that the Prophet ate like that, the fact that the companions, many, the majority of them ate like that. Um, also, this time around, there's going to be much more time for self-reflection. Again, all the time you're going to save commuting, not just to work and coming back from work, but also commuting to the masjid, uh, having to uh, stand all of these, uh, sorry to say that, but all these fundraisers and waiting sometimes for hours, all of that time is going to be saved. Uh, there's no one who's going to be harassing you, you know, and keeping you up 
and not letting you start your Tanaweeh on the Laylatul Lay Qadr because they want to raise money. All of that is gone. But think of it this way. This is time gained. Don't waste that time. Use that time in your favor. And one of the things you want to do this time around, which you probably did not do in the past, is allocating some time for self-reflection. That's a really important part of the month of Ramadan. Think Ramadan is the time where you like review the past year and you do a lot of uh, deep contemplation and deep uh, reflection. And again, like I said, and maybe in the past Ramadans, we did not do that for various reasons. And some of them were very legitimate reasons. But, you know, this time, alhamdulillah, we have this opportunity. So let's take advantage of that situation and try and also do some of that. So it's about individual worship, deeper worship, focus more, and do more reflection. Uh, and, uh, and it's also better for sincerity. There's no one to, you know, there's no one uh, to show your worship to. Uh, there's nothing to prove here. You're in your house with your family. So there's no one to impress. So it is also better for sincerity. That's another good aspect. Also, because you're going to have a bit more time, maybe you want to uh, come up with, uh, or, or at least do the acts of worship that you did not have time to do in the other Ramadans. Like maybe some acts of worship you always wanted to do, but you had no time. And now you have the time. And I'll give you, you know, very, very small examples. Like, for example, the dua at the time of iftar. We know from the hadith of the Prophet, uh, you know, والسلام, that breaking fast, uh, you know, or making dua at the time of breakfast. So like, you, you know, you eat something. Like, you, let's say you eat your dates, your water, or maybe you have a little bit of sambusa, whatever you, you have, you know, to break your fast. In the past, you had to rush and eat everything so you can make it to the masjid. Now, you have this golden opportunity, this window of dua that you never had time to, to do in the past. But now there's nothing else. I mean, there's no rush, right? You don't have to be in the masjid by 7.30 or 8 or 9. You have plenty of time, right? So now, you can take maybe 5 minutes or 10 minutes. And maybe if you want some seclusion or some time alone, go outside. You, break, you broke your fast, so you're following the sunnah. Go outside and think of all the dua you want to make. Like maybe you can make even a list if, you, if, you, you know, if it doesn't come to you right away. Make a list and go outside and focus on that dua because you know this is a time when the dua is accepted. You take five, ten minutes, you come back in, and you, you eat with your family. But think now you've created a brand new opportunity to uh, do something you know you wanted to do, you know it's from the Sunnah of the Prophet, but you never had time to do. Or you, maybe you did it in a, in a hurry, in a rush. Like maybe you, you got in the car, you still putting your abaya on halfway through, and you're making that dua, but you have no concentration, no focus. Now you have more time. So take advantage of that. Like I said, you're going to have more energy, more time. The key is take advantage of that. Uh, you know, you can put more time in Quran recitation, maybe more longer sujood. Again, you, you know, a lot of people complain in the past, oh, the imam is so fast. We have no time to say subhan rabbi al-ala, not even once. Because he wants to finish the Quran and sujood, uh, you know, it's uh, one minute sujood or maybe a 50 second sujood or something like that. Now, again, there's no rush. Now you can make the sujood as long as you want. You, you can make the ruku' as long as you want. Enjoy it. For once, enjoy the prayer. So these are things, like I said, you need to, to think positively, come up with alternatives, and um, think of these acts of worship, or even the same act of worship, how can I improve it? How can I do something that I could not have done in the past because of this or that? Now that I have more time or energy, let me be more creative. And by that, I don't mean that you innovate something new. No, this is all from the Sunnah of the Prophet Islam. But now you have a chance to, to do that. So I'll stop here, inshallah. I think, I, as usual, I uh, unfortunately, I passed my time, uh, but I hope this was helpful. And uh, inshallah, maybe we can take some uh, comments or questions uh, to, uh, you know, uh, in case you have any. Let, I think I, I see one already. What are the guidelines for praying tarawih at home? How long should it be? Should I try to cover the Quran if I'm not a Hafiz? Well, I mean, uh, the guideline from the Prophet والسلام, is simple. Uh, so uh, let's keep in mind a few things. The Prophet, first of all, والسلام, I know this is a big debate among people. 
uh, this famous 8 versus 20 debate, right? But if you go to the Sunnah of the Prophet, you cannot find a statement from the Prophet that says, you have to pray, you know, 8, or you have to pray 11, or 13, or 20. By the way, all of these are mentioned in the Hadith, not just uh, the, the 8. The, the bottom line is, the Prophet ﷺ never mentioned a count, a number. He only mentioned that if you pray at night, pray two, two, two. So you can pray as many twos as you want. It has to be a multiple of two. And then at the end, you pray tarawih. Uh, sorry, not tarawih. You pray witr, which is odd. So you want to pray 20, for example. That's a multiple of two. Great. And then you pray your uh, witr, which is like one or three. Likewise, if you pray eight, that is even. That's a multiple of two. And then you add, you know, three. You got your 11 rakah. That's all the prophet mentioned. He said it has to be even. You pray two, two, two. And then you end it with a witr. Now, how many? It's up to you. Now, yes, it happened that at the time of the Prophet, he used to like to pray eight. And the reason he liked it is because he wanted um, to have longer prayer. So he enjoyed the long prayer. But at the time of Omar and after that, when the 20, when the 20 came about, uh, many Muslims realized that having long prayers is hard. And not everybody was ready to do that. So they said, well, if we broke it up further, and this is, this is all the, also the son of the Prophet because he said, pray as many twos as you like. If we pray 20, that's easier on people because there's more movement. So you're not standing up for uh, you know, half an hour or an hour uh, reciting you know, Quran and your back is hurting. Now you have more movements, so it's much easier on the body. That's a reason, but there's no ritual or, or religious reason. Uh, so this is why both are okay. Uh, and in fact, they, they kind of measured it in such a way to make it all equal out. So yes, you have longer recitation in the eight, but there, if you increase the number enough, it will, ma it, it will about match the same duration. So nowadays when people pray eight and they do it the same, um, uh, you know, they, they take less time, they're not really following the sunnah. I mean, the idea is to keep the same time, but one will be longer in, uh, in Qiyam and Rukur and Sujood and the other one will be faster but it will even out like the duration if it's two hours it should be two hours for both eight and twenty anyway that's a long, long long topic the point is if you are in the house you are the king you decide what is suitable for you you decide what is suitable for your family and of course if you have uh, an opportunity to pray with the family that's even better now it doesn't have I mean it doesn't have to be very strict as I said uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet Alaihissalam. Uh, that tarawih is voluntary in essence so yes you want to encourage the family but if they can only pray <clears throat> four or eight and you're praying 20 that's fine at least they prayed eight that's better than not praying anything so i would say encourage your family to pray with you as much as possible and the last part of the question is uh, should i recite the whole quran if i'm not a hafiz i mean the reason uh, people uh, dictate or mandate that you pray and you, you recite the whole Quran is because this is the only opportunity in the year where the majority of people recite Quran from beginning to end. Again, it's nothing like, oh, it is wajib or it is mandatory from a religious perspective. Like this, again, there's nothing from the Quran or the, the Prophet that says you have to finish the Quran. But it has been uh, uh, customary and it has been the tradition because this is the only opportunity where people get to read the Quran from beginning to end. If you don't do it in Ramadan, you're not going to do it after Ramadan. Unless you are like a very good like worshiper or scholar or something like that. The vast majority of people do not do it. So that's why we got this idea that at least in Ramadan, let's get it finished. Let's get it completed. Now, if you don't uh, memorize the Quran, then, uh, I mean, I don't see a problem if you put a, a copy of the Quran in front of you and you read from it. I mean, many scholars allow that. Uh, because there's no other way to do it. I mean, there's no other way uh, to uh, complete the Quran if you don't use a copy in front of you. But, you know, make sure that uh, the Quran is respected, you know, so you can hold it and then you can have maybe, a, you know, a table next to you. You can put the mushaf or the copy of the Quran on the table and then you make your ruku'ah and sujood. Or now you can use a, an app on the, uh, on the phone uh, that's even easier to handle. Uh, so there are many different options here. Do you want me to read the questions or do you, do you want, uh, would the, I don't know, the admin like to read them? 
uh, which is uh, whichever uh, is more effective. If you don't mind, can can you read the questions before you answer them? That would be great, Jazak. No, I was wondering if you want to read them. Uh, um, so while sure. I'm answering, you're ready for the next question. That way, we save time. Sure. So okay. the next question is asking um, any books that you would recommend to read in Ramadan other than the Quran, of course. Hmm. I'm a, uh, I'm an avid reader. I'm a, you know, I, I like to read and I read a lot, uh, but I read all kinds of books, uh, you know, but it is customary in the month of Ramadan that even like it was the habit of scholars in the month of Ramadan uh, to drop or to leave out all of the other reading and to focus on the Quran. Um, for example, Imam Malik, uh, rahimahullah, you know, he used to teach uh, al muatta you know, the famous uh, hadith book. But in the month of Ramadan, he would close the hadith book and focus on the Quran. And he would tell his students, you know, pause all of your uh, studies and focus on the Quran. So maybe one thing I would say, especially because uh, like nowadays we don't understand the Quran as much as they used to, maybe the, the next level of reading would be uh, uh, perhaps picking a commentary of the Quran uh, because that is a very good supplement, if you will, or it's a complementary reading to the reading of the Quran itself. Because obviously when you read the Quran, some of it will be easy to understand, but some of it you may not understand. So maybe you want to find your favorite tafsir. And there, alhamdulillah, now, now there are uh, you know, quite a bit. Uh, some of them are in English, some of them are not. Uh, so if it is... Uh, uh, you know, in, in English, actually, we have translations. That's one thing. But there's also now some commentaries, too. So I would advise that you maybe pick one in English, but also if you have another language, because usually in the other languages, whether it's Arabic or Urdu or Hindi or Persian or Turkish, uh, you're going to find maybe a more variety of tafsir. You're going to see more commentaries on the Quran in those languages. So if you have another tongue, also pick a copy of a tafsir in that tongue, if you master that tongue. So that way you're gonna get, because what is important about tafsir, there's not one tafsir that is comprehensive or that has gotten everything in it. So the way you wanna do it is maybe read from different tafsir, from different uh, book of, books of exegesis, and then you'll come up hopefully with uh, a nice summary. Uh, so that way, when you read the Quran, you, now you're increasing your understanding as well. So that's one idea. But, you know, in general, I, obviously reading is allowed, is mubah, is, is permissible in the month of Ramadan. So you can keep read, reading your favorite books. Uh, but I think anything spiritual, anything, uh, like for example, the last Ramadan, and I'll, I'll get you the name of the book, it's been a while now. Either last Ramadan or Ramadan before, but it's been a while, like it's been almost a year, right? So... It was actually a book written about fasting by a non-Muslim. It was written a while back, but it was so good. I mean, he was like talking about different um, uh, benefits of fasting and I thought it was very, very helpful. So inshallah, if I think of the book, I'll maybe send it to the admin and maybe they can, or maybe I'll bring it next time, inshallah, if we have next time. So uh, yeah, books like that, why not? I mean, I thought it was very uh, beneficial for me. So uh, you can always find books like that that could enhance uh, your experience and, uh, you know, be very fun to read. So there are actually a few questions, Sheikh Anas, in regards to um, being able to do virtual Taravi. Uh, are we, um, uh, the questions are, are we allowed to follow an imam like via Zoom or something so we can follow them and finish the Quran? Yeah, to be honest, I mean, I've been following this uh, issue and I've looked at different fatawa from different committees. Uh, so we have like various committees in, in the United States, uh, the issue fatawas. And it seems like the majority of scholars uh, right now are still with the opinion that a virtual jama'a, whatever it is, whether taraweeh or jama'a or otherwise, that virtual jama'a does not count as an actual congregational prayer. Now, I think that means that uh, even if you think that you're following the imam, you may not get the reward of a, an actual congregational prayer. 
However, I would not go as far as saying that you cannot do it at all. Like, like you said, if somebody does not know the Quran, does not memorize the Quran, and you have the opportunity to pray behind uh, an imam who is, uh, you know, a hafiz, right? I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not willing to go all the way and say you cannot do it. But I might say that you, you're not going to, obviously, you're not going to get the congregational uh, prayer reward. But you still use it for your own benefit because now you don't have to open the mushaf and read. Now you can, uh, you know, follow someone else. And the problem is, I mean, the, the reason they mention uh, in their fatwa is because once you, you separate people like that, so now they're not close to each other. And they're like vast distances, like miles and miles, right? So the imam could be in one city, you could be in another city, or maybe in the greater uh, city, but you're still far apart. And they say one of the requirements for a congregational prayer is the proximity, that you have to be close enough. I mean, some scholars debate maybe having a wall, which now we allow, obviously, because the masjid has several walls, or it could be on a separate floor, but that's the, the extent they're willing to go. But so they're still hesitant. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, did I lose you? Yeah, they still basically they're still hesitant to uh, tell people that you can go all the way and uh, you know and uh, and make it count exactly like congregational prayer. But I would say that uh, there's still some room, especially for the people who cannot um, uh, like recite, for example. So even if they hold a mushaf, maybe they're not able to recite. So for those people, I think uh, they should be willing and be, be able uh, to, uh, to follow somebody. And that would be my, you know, it's kind of a in-between opinion. So it's not that it's going to be like a congregational prayer in the masjid, but I would say it's still allowed because uh, this is the only way you're going to be able to recite the whole Quran or to, to follow the whole Quran and uh, have a similar experience. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Anas. I think these were the questions for this evening. Uh, would you be able to do a short dua for the community? Inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, amabad. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. O oh Allah, we ask you to allow us to live until the month of Ramadan. O oh Allah, oh Allah, allow us to see the month of Ramadan and to worship you in the month of Ramadan. O oh Allah, you know, allow us to experience the beauty of the month of Ramadan like, like uh, no other time. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to make this Ramadan very special for us. We ask you to allow us to take advantage of the opportunities we're going to have in, the, in this month like no other month. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to allow us to uh, stand up in prayer in the nights of Ramadan, allow us to reach Laylatul Qadr. And we ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remove any harm and to stop any harm uh, uh, to happen to any one of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep this disease away from all of us and to protect us and to reward us for our patience. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, above all, to give us the gift of patience so that we're able to cope and survive the uh, hardship, this difficulty, and to inshallah make it safely into the month of Ramadan and outside the month of Ramadan and uh, to protect our community and everybody else. Ameen.